Chapter 10 of The Whispering Eye by G. T. Fleming Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Stop, murderer. The following morning, Kip Burland read the early edition of Jeff Weedham's paper, The Daily Opinion, with his breakfast coffee. The latest story concerning the criminal exploits of the eye was headlined I is Black Hood. Berkey. The following story told how A. J. Berkey, filling station operator from a northern suburb, had been held in Toombs Prison for questioning in conjunction with the murder and robbery at the Weedham plant. The night before, Berkey had confessed that his boss, the criminal known as the Eye, was actually the Black Hood. The part of the story that put a dull ache in Kipperland's heart was the fact that it was bylined by Barbara Sutton the Daily Opinion police reporter, and more particularly the woman whom Kipperland loved. There was another eye story, stating that the body of Jack Carlson had been found. This murder, too, was attributed to the eye. And once again it was pointed out that the eye and the black hood were one and the same. As night fell upon the city, Kipperland once more vanished behind the identity of the black hood, not without full realization that he was taking his life into his hands. Again he visited the Weedham estate on West End Avenue, this time determined to have a talk with Major Paxton. Prowling around the house in search for a suitable entrance, Black Hood discovered that he could not have come at a worse time. William Weedham was host to Sergeant McGinty and his cops, as well as a number of reporters, including Barbara Sutton and her clumsy cameraman, Joe Strong. Evidently, the police expected to gain further information about the crimes of the eye. Black Hood took to a stout iron trellis, climbed quickly to the second story where he found a bedroom window open. He slipped into the empty bedroom, and from there went into the hall. Tiptoeing down the hall, he came to a small upstairs living room in which a light burned. There, studying a European war map, was Major Paxton. Black Hood entered silently and closed the door behind him. As the Major looked up, Black Hood stepped quickly forward so that his tall figure overshadowed that of the peppery little Major. "'What? What? Who?' Paxton sputtered. "'Why, look here! You can't come in here like this!' "'But I am in,' Black Hood said quietly. "'And you won't utter a sound, or you'll force me to live up to my unjustly earned reputation as a murderer.' "'But it's illegal! It's—it's it's damnable!' "'Now sit down and cool off, Major,' Black Hood said patiently. "'You can blow off steam after I've left.' "'Left, huh? You get out of here over my dead body!' Black Hood nodded. "'If necessary, even that—' But first we're going to have a quiet little chat, you and I. A little talk about a check in the amount of forty thousand dollars. I'll not pay you one cent, Paxton exploded. Why, do you think you can frighten me into— I have frightened you, Major, Black Hood said, smiling. And it won't cost you a cent, either. All I want you to do is take a look at this check— Black Hood drew the check, which he had taken from the dead fingers of the murdered Bigart, from a pocket in his belt. He held it so that Paxton could look at it. Paxton stared, and then suddenly looked at the Black Hood's eyes revealed in the slots of his black mask. "'Why, it's made out to me!' "'Remarkable, isn't it?' Black Hood said. "'It was found in the fingers of the murdered Bigart.' He turned the check over to show the endorsement. Is that your signature? It most certainly is. But great heavens, I didn't receive any money from William Weedham. I'll have you know that I am a man of independent means. He's never given me a penny. Why, what does this mean? Black Hood studied the little man closely. He had seen liars before, and it seemed to him that if Paxton was lying, he was doing a remarkable job of it. That's your signature, though, he persisted. Yes, but I didn't sign it. The Major pressed a hand to his forehead. "'Wait! I have an idea. A mere ghost of an idea.' He reached into his pocket and pulled out a cigarette lighter. "'My signature is engraved on this lighter,' he explained. 
Anyone could have borrowed my lighter and traced that endorsement. Let me see that check a moment. Black Hood shook his head. And have you destroy it? He said with a smile. Rather, let me see the lighter. The Major handed over the cigarette lighter, holding it beneath the check. Black Hood could see that the signature of Paxton on the back of the check followed in every detail the engraved signature on the lighter. He handed the lighter back. And the signature of William Weedham, he said. Take a look at that. Major Paxton scowled. He shook his head doubtfully. It could be genuine, and then again it could be a forgery. It seems to me— The door behind Black Hood opened. The master manhunter wheeled, saw the lank figure of Jeff Weedham standing in the door. Jeff Weedham opened his mouth, shouted at the top of his voice, d d d dad Help! The Black Hood! And then young Weedham tried a necktie tackle that was supposed to flatten Black Hood to the floor. Black Hood bent double to duck that high tackle. The result was that Jeff Weedham landed squarely across the Black Hood's broad back. The manhunter straightened, threw Jeff to the floor, darted from the room, and out into the hall. The stairway was within three long strides of him. Black Hood slid halfway down the broad stair railing before he saw William Weedham and Sergeant McGinty at the foot of the steps waiting for him. McGinty had his gun out. Black Hood kicked his legs over the rail, reversing his position, gave himself a shove with his hands. He dropped over the railing, landed on his feet in the hall below. He turned, dashed through a door that stood open beneath the stairs. This brought him into a huge dining room. But he wasn't there long enough to tell about it. He went through a swinging door into a butler's pantry, then into a kitchen. There was a cop at the back door waiting for him. He pivoted in his tracks, doubled back into the dining room, went through another door that brought him to the living room. No way out there. And then he remembered that William Weedham's library was between living room and hall. The French windows of the library might be one avenue of escape which McGinty's thinly spread men were not guarding. He reached the library, ran to the French windows. They were locked but the key was in place. He was about to unlock the windows when he heard the door off the hall open and close. Stop! Murderer! Black Hood turned, just a little slowly this time, because he had recognized that voice, a voice that haunted his dreams as did the face of the lovely girl who owned it. Barbara Sutton stood in the doorway, a small but businesslike revolver in her hand. End of chapter 10. Chapter 11 of The Whispering Eye by G. T. Fleming Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Frame Complete. Barbara, the Black Hood said quietly, you're joking. She shook her head. Her lower lip trembled. Black Hood took two steps toward her and saw her gun wrist stiffen. Listen, he said grimly. I could take that penny pea shooter away from you in a second. I want you to know that I'm staying here in this room when every second of delay may spell my death. I'm staying here because if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to convince you that I'm not a killer. And I'm not the eye. That picture Joe took, she said, and that confession of the man in the tombs, and you've told me time and time again that you're an outlaw. He nodded. If my real identity were known, the police could take me on the charge of robbery, but that charge would be a frame, just as this one is. I can never clear myself of the robbery charge. But I can and will clear the black hood of the charge of murder. Joe must have got that picture by accident. I was simply bending over that watchman at the Weedham plant gate to see if there was any chance that he was alive and had witnessed the crime. When I saw the knife, I planned to withdraw it from the watchman's throat to use it as possible evidence. You have to believe me, Barbara. I'm fighting this creature who calls himself the I, just as you are, and just as the police are. You and I have been through a lot of adventures together, 
ask yourself if i have ever done a single thing which would indicate that i would stoop to the slaughter of the innocent ask yourself that barbara he took another step toward her her violet eyes glistened with tears joe strong has tried to poison your mind against me he said i can't blame him for that since all's fair in love and war but you've got to believe me barbara you've got to believe me because because i love you i've always loved you from the first day i set eyes on you and the gun spilled from barbara's limp fingers and suddenly she was in his arms he held her fiercely tenderly for a long moment kissed her warm lips and then there were sounds of footsteps in the hall he heard jeff weedham say did, did, did anybody look in the library black hood released barbara turned dashed back to the french windows he looked back before he plunged out into the darkness and his teeth gleamed in a smile barbara was smiling too smiling and crying at the same time there was a police guard at the gate of the weedham estate but then black hood had never cared a whole lot about using gates anyway he raced across the lawn, vaulted over the wall which separated the Weedham property from the place belonging to the green-eyed Vida Gervais next door. To all appearances, the green-eyed lady was not at home, not unless those cat-like eyes of hers were capable of seeing in the dark. Black Hood found his way into the house through a window. Inside, the house was as silent as it was dark. Eventually, he found his way to Vida Gervais's boudoir, and there poked and sniffed among the boxes and jars of cosmetics on her dressing table. A box of face powder attracted his particular attention, and when he looked into the adjoining bathroom, he discovered a suitable means of testing the powder to make sure that it was the same which he had scraped from the coat lapel of the dead Jack Carlson. Evidently, the lady was somewhat concerned about her pale complexion, for there was a sun-lamp in the bathroom. Beneath its ultraviolet rays, Black Hood discovered that the face powder took on a phosphorescent glow, proving that sodium naphthionate had been added to it. He took the powder with him when he left the house a few minutes later, dressed in a spare uniform of Vider Gervais's chauffeur. It was an hour later that Black Hood came to an obscure little jewelry shop known simply as Tauber's. It was here that the eyes crimesters were supposed to pull their next job, according to the plans which had been set forth at the meeting on the night before. Whether or not Black Hood's unexpected appearance at that meeting had put a crimp in those plans, he did not know. But there was no way of learning except by trial and error. Except for a nightlight which glinted through the show window, the place was dark. Black Hood reflected that had he any desire to live up to his false reputation as a criminal he could have done very nicely for himself it required just twenty minutes of work for him to open the window at the back of the shop steel grill work burglar alarm lock and all it was rather a tight squeeze for his broad shoulders getting through the opening but he managed it no sooner had his feet hit the floor however then he felt the cold stern prod of the barrel of an automatic all right mr hood put up your hands black hood jerked a glance over his right shoulder to behold the unlovely visage of mr ron the bugs brayton hi there bugs he said lightly raising his hands to the level of his shoulders fancy meeting you here brayton laughed if you'd a knocked at the front door, we'd a let you in, Mr. Hood. It's pretty early for a heist, ain't it? But we figured the early bird would get the diamonds. And then you was wised up to this job, wasn't you? Oh, I did hear mention of it at the lodge meeting last night, Black Hood said. He laughed. Isn't that Squid Murphy over there in the corner, trying to disguise himself as a corner of that safe? Murphy stepped out of the shadows. He had a gun in his fist. A third hood put in his appearance from the front of the store, and a fourth came out of Tauber's private office. "'You're just a little bit too late, Mr. Hood,' Bugs Brayton said. "'That is, too late to get your hands on these beauties.' Brayton extended his right arm in front of him. He was holding a small leather satchel. 
the mouth of the bag wide open. What light there was in the place scintillated on a layer of unset diamonds in the bottom of the bag. It was then that Black Hood got one of those sudden inspirations which had made him the underworld's most capable adversary. His right hand dropped with incredible swiftness to his wide black belt, snatched something from a concealed pocket there. That same hand shot out toward the bag of diamonds, lingered over its open mouth a moment before it clenched into a fist and hammered to the point of Squid Murphy's jaw. Murphy went back very fast and didn't stop until he had rammed into Tauber's safe. But the three other hoods closed in upon Black Hood. Bugs Brayton's big automatic rose and fell like an axe. The barrel of it caught Black Hood on the temple with stunning force. Black Hood fell to the floor, and an unidentified but effective shoe toe caught the side of his head with a powerful kick. Blazing blobs of light exploded within his brain and then the total blackness of unconsciousness funneled down upon his brain. Bugs Brayton stood over the fallen manhunter. He weighed his automatic thoughtfully in his hand. He looked at Squid Murphy and the others. "'Well, boys,' he said, "'I guess it's up to me to finish off Mr. Hood, "'and I can't say that I got any regrets about him dying so young.' He laughed, stooped over Black Hood, pressed the muzzle of his gun to the manhunter's forehead. "'Stop, Bugs!' came a whispered command from the front of the store. Brayton straightened, coming toward the group of crimesters around the unconscious Black Hood, was the man they knew as the Eye, his white rubber mask resembling a death's head in the half-light. "'It would be a grave mistake to kill Black Hood, Brayton,' the Eye said. Once he is dead, the police will turn their attention to others, perhaps to any one of us. You understand? But the guy's dangerous, Squid Murphy protested. I'll take my chances with the bulls any day rather than with Black Hood. He won't be dangerous to us in prison, the criminal chief argued. Hand me the gems, Brayton. Brayton obeyed. He watched the eye's slim white fingers reach down into the layer of diamonds, watched them sift the glittering gems. Then he took a dozen or so of the stones from the bag, transferred them to a pocket in Black Hood's belt. Now, he said, the frame is complete. I will take care of the gems, and as soon as I have sold them, I will split with you. Let's get out of here. So great was their fear of their leader that the crimesters obeyed without protest. Just outside the rear door of the jewelry shop, the criminal chief stopped, raised a whistle to his lips, and blew a skirling blast. "'What's the idea?' Brayton demanded, startled. "'To bring the police to the Black Hood, you fool!' End of Chapter 11 Chapter 12 of The Whispering Eye by G. T. Fleming Roberts. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Black Light. Black Hood staggered to his feet, his brain still whirling from that blow to his head. He lurched toward the front door of the shop, stopped halfway there, clung to a counter for support. Somebody was pounding on the front door. A hoarse voice was calling on him to open in the name of the law. Black Hood turned, spurred the muscles of his legs to carry on. The brilliant light of a policeman's torch sliced through the semi-darkness and spotted him. He kept going. Glass in the door shattered beneath a blow from the butt of the copper's revolver. Black Hood ran on leaden feet into the rear of the shop. The back door stood invitingly open. He stepped over the sill all but fell into the arms of a second cop. He struck just one wild haymaker of a blow that cleared the head of the cop by nearly a foot. And then, suddenly, there were two cops, one on either side of him. "'It's Black Hood!' one of the coppers shouted triumphantly. "'We've got him! We've got the eye! Wait till Sergeant McGinty hears about this!' Cold steel jaws of handcuffs closed on Black Hood's right wrist. 
a second cop frisked him quickly emptying the pockets of his belt look at the sparklers will you the policeman gasped the black hood his mind still in a daze stared down at the gems in the copper's hand no use telling him it was a frame that was the standard alibi of every crook who ever found his way into police courts they had him cold and in his present condition he was utterly unable to fight back as long as he lived he was never to forget that ride down to police headquarters nor could he ever forget standing there in sergeant mcginty's office while the sergeant did a bit of triumphant gloating as sure as my name's mcginty i knew there'd come a day like this mr blackhood alias the eye i've got ya and i've got ya where i want ya you'll burn in the chair mr hood black hood stood erect still handcuffed to the cop who had captured him he could think a little bit more clearly now and the muscles of his powerful body were much more inclined to obey the dictates of his taut nerves he looked at the top of the sergeant's desk there the entire contents of his belt pockets had been spread out the dozen diamonds which had been used to frame him that crumpled check which he had taken from the dead fingers of Biggert, the powder box from vita gervais's boudoir most of its contents now gone all his little tools and weapons which he had found valuable in his valiant fight against crime you know what i've done mr hood mcginty asked i've telephoned the members of the citizens committee who got together to tell the police what to do to catch the eye i've asked them and their friends to come down here to headquarters for the unveiling of the black hood alias the eye when they get here i'm going to jerk off that mask of yours and we'll have a little surprise party you might spare me that alias the eye business black hood said some of his old-time banter returning the eye died when jack carlson died and i can prove that since Carlson was murdered, another has taken his place. The man who killed Biggert, and also killed Jack Carlson, now wears the white rubber mask that identifies the eye, goes around whispering orders to professional rob and kill men. He's robbed Carlson's safe, and robbed Carlson of his life, and even robbed Carlson of his identity as the eye. And given half a chance, I'll prove that to you, McGinty mcginty frowned he could not deny that many times before black hood had beaten him to the solution of crimes much to his embarrassment and in each case mcginty had received full credit for the solving of these crimes when the time comes mr hood mcginty said you'll have your chance to speak your little piece i wouldn't deny that to any man then perhaps you'll unlock these handcuffs black hood suggested you've robbed my bag of all its tricks and i'm relatively harmless at the present time besides he added glancing at the cop to whom he was linked this man here becomes something of a liability after this length of time unlock the cuffs bricker mcginty ordered the cop black hood can't get out of here and that's a sure thing the cuff removed from his right wrist black hood went to a chair beside the desk and calmly sat down i want to appeal to your reason a moment sergeant before this committee arrives for the unveiling as you call it first of all is it reasonable to suppose that i would crack open a jewelry store just to get those few diamonds there on the desk and having broken into the store with intent to rob as you seem to think would i be silly enough to fall on my head and knock myself out could be those were the only diamonds you found in the store there were one hundred thousand dollars worth of unset diamonds in that store tonight black hood said and that's what this man who is posing as the eye went after and got the past record shows that none of these crimes have been what you would call petty a fact mcginty said which doesn't prove you haven't hid the diamonds somewhere but kept a few of them on my person just to get myself in jail huh black hood laughed listen mcginty why do you suppose biggert weedham's secretary was killed 
the shot that killed biggert was intended for jack carlson mcginty said so it was an accident that bigger was shot black hood shook his head jack carlson was nowhere near biggert when the latter fell that was no mistake Biggert was killed because he was about to expose somebody who had forged that check which is lying on your desk. That check is the piece of paper that was in Biggert's hand when he died. McGinty's eyes narrowed. How did you get a hold of that, Mr. Hood? Black Hood saw that he would have to lie in order to protect his prototype, Kip Berland. I reached the body of Biggert before Carlson or anyone else did. That's how I know Carlson wasn't near the man when the shot was fired. McGinty thought that over a moment. Go ahead, Mr. Hood. I'm not convinced, but every man has a right to free speech. Did the police notice the smudge of white powder on the lapel of Carlson's coat when they found his body? Did they notice that the regular light bulbs in his garage had been replaced with ultraviolet bulbs? McGinty nodded. Our lab men don't miss much. That smudge of powder contains some chemical that glows in black light. Oh, I figured it spotted Carlson for the killer, made a target out of him in the dark. Right, McGinty. But do you know that Carlson was betrayed by a woman named Vida Gervais? She lives in the house next to the Weedham place. That powder box which you took from my pocket and which is now on your desk is a sample of her face powder, treated with naphthionate of sodium. You can prove that yourself. And if you'll question the lady thoroughly, you'll be able to get at the truth. She'll know that Carlson was the eye, and she may even admit that she threw Carlson over and helped somebody else dispose of Carlson and step into the lucrative position which Carlson occupied as the eye. McGinty looked up at one of his men. Send out for that Gervais dame. When the man had left the room, he turned to Black Hood. You haven't cleared yourself yet. You claim Carlson was the eye. That's the world's oldest alibi. Putting the blame on a dead man. I can prove Carlson was the eye, Black Hood persisted. In the morning, I will send you that signal device which the eye used. It carries Carlson's fingerprints. You'll send it from jail, then? McGinty said. Black Hood shook his head. I wonder if you would send to the police lab for an ultraviolet lamp. I think I can conduct an experiment which will prove my points. McGinty considered this a moment and finally sent out for an ultraviolet lamp. It was not long after that before the members of the Citizens Committee began to arrive. The two Weedhams, father and son, were ushered into the room followed by Major Paxton, Harold Adler, and the rest of the committee. Jeff Weedham's newspaper was represented by Barbara Sutton and her ace cameraman, Joe Strong. And finally the police brought in a coldly furious Vida Gervais. Black Hood carefully avoided meeting Barbara Sutton's eyes. He knew that her emotions must be strained to the breaking point, and even a glance from him might have caused her to betray herself. D -d -d "'Don't tell me you finally caught Black Hood, Sergeant!' Jeff Weedham gasped. The sergeant smiled. "'Sooner or later, McGinty gets them all.' McGinty waited until all present were seated. Then he stood up alongside of Black Hood. "'Now, folks,' he said, "'as you can see, I've got Black Hood just where I want him, "'and I've wanted him quite a while. "'I promised you that I'd show you his face, "'and that's just what I'm going to do.' Harold Adler uttered a hoarse cry of warning that came just a bit too late. With one of those lightning-like movements of his, Black Hood had pulled the revolver out of McGinty's holster, turned it on the sergeant. A copper near the door started to intervene, but Black Hood stopped him with a narrow-eyed glance that held all the threat of a thunderbolt. "'Make a move toward me, and I put a bullet into McGinty's back,' he said." No one will ever see the face of the Black Hood and live to talk about it. I've just given McGinty the entire solution to this mystery. I've told him that Jack Carlson was the eye. I've explained how Jack Carlson was murdered and his powerful position in the underworld was usurped by another man who now poses as the eye. 
if there is any doubt in his mind i am about to dispel it black hood picked up the ultraviolet lamp with his left hand while his right kept the gun on mcginty he said mr adler will you kindly turn out the lights adler hesitated do as you're told black hood insisted if you don't want to witness murder and i want to warn everyone in this room that when the lights go out if anyone makes any move toward me mcginty will die if i were to be shot the reflex action of my fingers would pull the trigger of this revolver and mcginty will die i am no murderer but if you interfere with me in this business you'll make a murderer of me adler switched out the lights the darkness lay like a smothering blanket upon them all the air itself had a certain electrical tenseness about it like the silence before a storm i am now going to switch on the ultraviolet light if the filter is perfect you will not be able to see the light because ultraviolet rays when unadulterated by other rays cannot be seen by the human eye there the light is on i've offered evidence to sergeant mcginty in which i intended to prove that biggert william weedham's secretary was killed because he was about to show to william weedham a check to which william weedham's signature had been forged not only that but the forger in cashing the check also forged the endorsement of major paxton to whom the check was made out i have further pointed out to mcginty that this same killer disposed of jack carlson after carlson had been betrayed by a woman this woman must have been carlson's friend she must have known all his secrets including the fact that carlson was the eye she gave all this information to another man the same man who forged the check which i mentioned before then she assisted this killer to shoot carlson this woman's face powder was treated with naphthionate of sodium a little of this powder rubbed from her cheek to carlson's lapel made carlson a perfect target in pitch darkness provided that darkness was penetrated by rays of invisible ultraviolet or black light i have a sample of that woman's face powder here on mcginty's desk black hood turned the ultraviolet lamp on the desk the box of powder there became phosphorescent when i was framed for the tauber jewelry robbery tonight i seized the opportunity to toss some of this face powder onto the jewels in the robber's bag black hood continued the face powder is that of vita gervais watch please black hood turned the ultraviolet lamp out toward his audience vita gervais's frightened face glowed in the black light startled gasps could be heard from the others in the room as they stared at that ghostly face vita gervais black hood continued knew a good thing when she saw it to eventually better her social and financial position she was willing to sell out carlson alias the eye to another man who if he could accumulate through fair means or foul quite a tidy sum of money now would get his hands on a great deal more money in the future so vita gervais betrayed carlson alias the eye into the hands of the man who had killed biggert the forty thousand dollars which this man had got from the forged check was a small part of the money he needed but if he could step into the eye's shoes for a little bit he could rapidly accumulate the rest i mentioned a moment ago that i had tossed some of vita gervais's unusual face powder onto the diamonds stolen from tauber's shop the naphthionate in that powder would cling to the diamonds and subsequently cling to the hands of the criminal who eventually got hold of them watch now for the glowing hands of the killer the man who has been impersonating the eye ever since carlson was killed but one funny thing about that impersonation which i did not realize until tonight the impersonator this man who killed biggert and carlson was most careful to avoid any word or name beginning with the letter d he would not for instance say the name delancey nor would he speak the word diamonds why 
because every time he says a word or name beginning with that letter, he stutters. He might disguise his voice by whispering, but he could not control this stutter, which would have been a dead giveaway. In the black light, luminous fingers suddenly showed themselves. There was a piercing scream. Men surged forward to close in and blot out the glow from the killer's fingers. "'Watch out!' Black Hood's warning voice rang out. "'He's probably armed!' men bumped into each other. There was the repeated thud of blows. There were cries, grunts, stammered oaths. And when finally somebody turned on the lights, Jeff Weedham was on the floor, two cops astride him. He had a gun in his hand, but his hand was pinned to the floor. Sergeant McGinty looked over his shoulder at the Black Hood, or rather looked where he thought the Black Hood would be. McGinty's jaw sagged. He looked down at his own gun, which was poking him in the ribs. His revolver had been wedged into the baby gate extension arm of his own desk telephone, and Black Hood was gone. It was an hour later that McGinty and his men, by playing Vida Gervais and Jeff Weedham one against the other, got a full confession which corresponded very closely to Black Hood's reconstruction of the crimes. Jeff Weedham had been placed in rather a desperate position by his father, Jeff explained. William Weedham had bought Jeff the newspaper, insisting that he make a financial success of it, and thus prove his worth. If he failed in this, as he had in everything else, William Weedham was determined that none of the Weedham fortune should fall into Jeff's hands. Jeff had run his newspaper into the red. As the time came closer in which William Weedham was to examine the newspaper's ledger, Jeff Weedham tried desperately to make up the lost money, first by forgery, and then by stepping into Carlson's shoes as the eye. Ballistics tests proved that it was Jeff's gun which had killed both Biggert and Carlson. Just as McGinty was about to leave his office for the night, his phone rang. Almost before he picked the instrument up, he knew who his caller was. Well, I say, McGinty, the voice of the Black Hood came from the receiver. I really intended to apologize for making a fool of you there in your office, sticking you up with a gun attached to that telephone arm. But then, as I thought the matter over, it occurred to me that I really wasn't to blame for making a fool of you. You really got a bone to pick with dear old Mother Nature on that score. "'Say, will you kindly go to hell?' McGinty exploded, and as he hung up, a chuckle broke from his thick lips. Oh, "'What that guy don't know is that I'm beginning to get a kick out of tangling with him.'" End of Chapter 12 Recording by Scotty Smith End of The Whispering Eye, a Black Hood novel by G.T. Fleming Roberts